Hey everyone, welcome to another Speed Secrets Podcast. Today's guest is my good friend, Johannes von Overbeck. Johannes, thanks for coming back on the show. Ross, always glad to join you. Thanks for yeah. having me. Well, I, w- I was looking, the last time you and I did this, uh, it was April of 2019. And I think a lot of people were probably at this point in time go, oh, 2019, what a great year that was compared to 2020. So. Yeah, very different now than it was then, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the things we talked about back then, I think, uh, I'll be honest, I didn't go back and listen to the show we did. In fact, I rarely do that. But uh, um, uh, we did talk a little bit about you had kind of somewhat recently retired from full-time pro racing. And you talked a little bit about that. And so I think it'd be interesting for people to hear – I guess just a little bit about what you're doing now that you're not a full-time professional IMSA and other thing racer. What, what's up? Yeah, well, um, so yeah, I retired in 2018 and I uh, managed a really uh, nice car collection for a gentleman uh, on the peninsula. And that sort of dovetailed, I, I started that towards the end of my professional racing career. And it's, uh, you know, roughly $150 million car collection and has a McLaren F1 and a Le Mans winning 275 Ferrari and some really cool stuff. Ken Miles championship winning 289 Cobra before anybody outside of racing knew who Ken Miles was. Wow, cool. And these are all cars that I got to drive and, and uh, but most importantly, make better. Um, he's one of these guys that had all the money and was willing to spend it, but he just didn't quite understand what was required to make the cars good. So I got in and made a bunch of changes, but, um, uh, made them reliable and, uh, nice to drive, which, uh, was a revelation to him that you could have a reliable car. And I, I would have conversations, Hey, this car won Le Mans 1960, whatever. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to drive your cars and coffee without problems. Like it's, it's, (laughs) and then, um, uh, I left there and went into a, had an opportunity to, uh, work at a startup, uh, property tech, uh, startup and was there for a year. And then COVID hit and, uh, my whole department just got decimated because we were, uh, involved with, uh, high tech clients, namely Google, and they were doing a lot of construction. We were helping them, uh, but they put the brakes on all of it. And then uh, since then, I've been involved in a bunch of project-based work, which has been a lot of fun, primarily focused in the automotive space. So I've continued to coach. I write articles and uh, some features for Excellence Magazine, which is a Porsche-specific magazine. Um, I've been doing some development driving for Tesla which has been uh, really fun to sort of peek behind the curtain there. And, and uh, last September uh, I set the EV record at Laguna Seca in their new plaid model, which was uh, a, a tough task, but a lot of fun and um, done, done a little bit uh, with yours truly at, at Garmin, which has been, uh, which has been good. And, and then sort of the last piece that's been been taking up some time is um, my uh, fellow podcast guest, Craig Watkins, uh, engineer at uh, Flying Lizard. We have been uh, bringing in these Dutch dampers, uh, Tractive is the name of them, but what makes them unique is they're semi-active. And um, we've been focused on the early Porsche uh segment of the population and mainly that's where our reservoir of knowledge is, but also where, you know, people are willing to spend money to make their cars as good as they can be. But, uh, what these semi-active dampers allow you to do is have a new car ride in an old car, but also give you fantastic performance in, you know, on the racetrack or, uh, in the Canyon. So it's, it's, uh, uh we've been, unbelievably impressed. And, um, so continuing to work on that and get the word out with those. I got to think that, you know, having spent well, all your life around cars and driving and that whole thing, I mean, your passion is for that kind of stuff. And, uh, I've always kind of wondered when I see a driver that's able to walk away from the sport and just like completely walk away and like, how do they do that? 
And obviously you, you haven't done that. <laughs> You're still poking away at different parts of it and things. So it's, it's gotta be that part of it is that uh, you, you don't just turn that passion off. Well, it's interesting. I, uh, you know, on the, on the, on the startup business, working with a team, just like you do in racing, that was really enjoyable and, and knowing how to work within a team and, uh, how to drive for towards results and deliver things. And, uh, so that part was very familiar, but, you know, like you, my reservoir of, of knowledge is in the automotive space sort of broadly and racing specifically. And it's, it's a, you, you have kind of more credibility when you walk into a room, uh, if you're talking about automotive related things, so that's helpful, but, but also you just have this, you know, in my case, lifelong love of, of everything automotive and, and in particular the high performance end of it. And that's just a hard, hard thing to turn off. And, and so, yes, I've gravitated back towards more car related projects. Uh, and, and I'm actually curious because we haven't had a really chance to talk about this kind of stuff off from this thing, but I'm curious, uh, I mean, because you've done this stuff with Tesla. In fact, actually, before we go there, tell us a little bit about that, that experience of the, this lap record at Laguna in an electric vehicle. What was that like? It was eye-opening. It was, um, so this is a car that they have announced the specs on it. Uh, the plaid model is, you know, it's all the uh, playoff space balls. They had the ludicrous mode. It was the last model S and the, the plaid is the new high performance version of the upcoming, uh, 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 uh model S replacement. Uh, it has, uh, 1100 horsepower. It goes zero to 60 in less than two seconds. It will go 200 miles an hour and has a range. Uh, as I recall, it's nearly 500 miles. It's ridiculous, like a, a wow. big range. I, I, I don't remember the range exactly. I wasn't doing range testing, I can assure <laughs> you. But, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, how much does it weigh? It weighs, you know, 4,500 pounds ish, wow. a lot. Yeah. yeah. It weighs a lot. And, um, to give you to sort of encapsulate the experience in one quick story. Uh, so for those of you listeners who've been to Laguna Seca, uh, just past the flag stand, there's a, there's a rise and, and it bends to the left and falls, falls away into turn two. Uh, this car has so much power that you get wheel spin going over at 150 miles an hour going over that crest. And, um, cool. you know, you don't, you don't get, uh, it's very cool. It's, it's startling. Uh, I mean, it, it's as fast as any car race cars included I've ever driven. And, and luckily the traction control is very sophisticated. So it's the acceleration is pretty drama free, but it's, uh, it's the first time you put your foot to the floor. It's, it's, uh, like nothing else you've experienced. Lap time. Uh, we did a 130.3, which was uh, basically as fast as uh, Randy Pope's drove a 918 Porsche around Laguna Seca. Wow. And that was a four door, seven seater sedan. 4,500 <laughs> pound car. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yes. Huh. Yeah. So the next objective is to beat uh, the McLaren Senna, which is the all time track, street driven track record holder at Laguna Seca. What's that lap time? I'm curious. Uh, 127 and change. Oh, okay. Okay. That seems so doable. It's not, it seems doable. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly have uh, some more work to do to get there, but uh, the Tesla guys are bright and uh, uh, Elon Musk is not one to uh, back down from challenges. So I, I suspect it'll get done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so what I was going to ask is, you know, because of, that you mean the sort of the electric car thing um these dampers that you're working with uh you know even stuff like the garmin catalyst that we've been doing some stuff with you know there's there's just and i don't know if it's any different than it ever has before but there's a lot of new stuff coming into 
I guess, I don't know if it's new, but you know, it's just, it's new developments and new technology and that kind of thing. And I, I'm kind of curious what your perspective on like, what's next out there? What, what do you see? And, and maybe it's a, you know, your insights in the, where data is going and where electric vehicles are going that kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, you know, technology is certainly, you know, I've had the good fortune of driving some modern GT3 spec cars, which is what runs in the IMSA GTD class. And, you know, the cars are so sophisticated with traction control and ABS and, they are really fun to drive and it definitely helps every driver be better. Um, and, you know, whether it's, you know, tractive semi-active dampers or, um, uh, you know, a, a new version of, of uh, ABS or a new coaching tool like Catalyst, um, you still... So I guess number one is the technology kind of helps most people get closer towards being good at, at the task of driving. Uh, but to really be great, just like in anything, you have to put in that much more time and effort. Um, but I certainly see, you know, the work I've done with Tesla where for track related activities, and I think any manufacturer could do this as well where imagine being on track and, you know, the catalyst ties into the heads up display on the windshield, sort of like a yeah. fighter pilot and like, you know, Forza or some game like that, where it starts to give you a, a line on the track as you're learning, like, okay, you're, you're exiting this corner and, and you look up in your heads up display and it has this sort of imaginary ghost line that where you should place the car, which you know, for a beginning driver would be a fantastic, uh, tool. And then, you know, have the, the coaching abilities of catalyst speak to you over Bluetooth, which it already does and sort of help you get better and better and better. But, um, uh, so yeah, there, there, there are lots of interesting things on the horizon and, and it's just, it's, it, it's making the sport of driving, I think that much more approachable and that much more fun. Well, let's flip that around the other way, though. Like, sorry, but Mario Andretti, AJ Foyt, they didn't have any of those things, and they did pretty well, and they had some fun. Uh, it has it become a, I'm curious what your opinion is on, is it become too easy? And, and maybe one of the things is, and I'd like your opinion on this, because as a coach, you know, some people come along and go, well, just get in my car, go and drive a lap, and then I'll copy what you did has somebody really learned from that or have they really like, have they learned how to drive or have they learned how to copy? That person that makes that comment, uh, that's a clue that they don't have any clue what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've, well, uh, now I know your and, opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, and God agree. bless them. If, if it was only that easy, it's like, you know, going to Travis Pastrana and saying, Hey, do two double backflips. And I'm just going to do that. Like, you know, consequences are potentially less, but, uh, as I share with you before the show started, uh, I was with a, a gentleman, uh, two days ago, had a horrific accident. And so the consequences are still very real. Um, the, the technology allows both in cars and outside of cars allows you to go faster than ever. And we live in a, a bit of a padded world where you can get away, you know, you can hit a tree at 35 miles an hour head on and walk away. And yeah. maybe your baseball hat's askew, but you're fine. But you try that in a, you know, 1965 Mustang and it's probably game over. So, you know, it's things are safer. That's great. But the consequences are still very real if, if you get it wrong and you know, you, these new cars seem to defy physics, but in the end you don't. So, um, it's the unwise person that thinks it's, it's easy and, uh, you can just jump in and, you know, do what Ross Bentley does around a racetrack. And after watching one lap, it's just not, it, it's something that requires a lot of thought and skill. And I think, you know, most people that have tried to get better at driving, 
or golf or fill in the blank, know that it just takes time and, and deliberate practice to be better at it. So the technology probably breaks down some of the barriers, but to truly be good at it, you still have to expend a great amount of effort. Well, it's, it's, it's got me thinking about the, the difference between, you know, when you're on the, you're on a simulator and it shows you that little line and basically you're following that line. To me, there's a difference between following that line and, you know, for example, what the Garmin Catalyst does is it provides you feedback on, you just did that better, or you could do this, you could move your brake zone in here. So it's, I guess, yeah, it's it's like us coaching. We can say just copy what we do, or there's the uh, do more of that and do less of this, and you learn what you're doing. And I think, um, I personally, I think there's a danger in just simply copying. And I think that's, like you said, the technology is there for a heads-up display that actually projects some kind of a line like a you know virtual reality line on a racetrack in front of you but you're really learning how to do it or again are you just following following a line that somebody else has drawn i think it it's um you know you and i both spent millions of miles literally on airplanes and it gets down to feel and you have to have to be truly good at it you have to have a feel for the machine in my, in my opinion. And so when you fly and you get to your destination, you can tell instantly the pilot without knowing the resume, without knowing anything about anything, the pilots that land and you, and you think, Oh, do, do we hit the ground? I, I'm not sure. Versus the pilot that just smashes the thing on the ground. That's the difference between somebody who has a feel for what they're doing versus somebody who's connecting the dots and copying. Ah. And, and the same is true in, in, in driving, you, you can be, you can get, uh, uh, uncomfortably fast in my opinion, not having a good feel for the car, especially in modern cars with a lot of nannies, but to be truly great, you have to have the feeling which comes from understanding, Oh, why do I need to apex? late here or what's the point of braking late or what's the point of brake release and carrying speed into the corner and and sort of understanding the reasons behind the techniques that you're employing because if you don't understand them you're going to hit a wall and and you're probably just don't have a uh you're you're cheating yourself because you're you're not developing that seat of the pants feel that every great driver has well, okay, so that gets us into the whole thing of to be a great driver, uh, do I need to drive on a track and turn all my stability control, traction control, everything off? And because uh, I, I have to say, that's a question that I get an awful lot when I'm talking to different instructors. And a lot of instructors sort of in the, you know, that HPDE, high performance driver education world, car club events, that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, there are some instructors who say you can never learn how to really drive a car until you turn all that stuff off and you learn how to drive with it. And there are others that are like, well, I'm not going to be in the car when you do turn that off. So I understand that. Um, and I actually, you know, I, I, well, I think that there is certainly truth to the, you can't really learn the limits until you turn all that stuff off. Uh, I do think that there is, you can learn a lot by playing with and working with those systems. Like I have, I'm not going to say it was a rental car, but it might've been on a racetrack that had, you know, a pretty intrusive stability control system. And to be able to play around with that and go, how, how can I use that to my advantage? How can I kind of come into a corner and know that it's going to cut in now and it gets me pointed and I go, and I actually use that. Is that a, I guess, is that a valuable skill? Yeah, at some point, you you being the person who's trying to get better at driving needs to learn car control. And whether that's 
in your new 500 horsepower GT3 on a racetrack, or is that in a wet parking lot or on a snowy autocross or, a you know, some, some sort of rally type school? I mean, car control is, is at the core required to be good at driving on the racetrack, whether you're racing or time trialing or track days, it's, it's just a prerequisite. And I, um, every driver should have a good handle on how to control a car, um, when it's out of control or going out of control. <clears throat> and in terms of uh, some of those technologies, especially in the more modern cars, to your point, you know, they have various, there's the, there, there's the standard mode and there's a sport mode and a sport plus, and, you know, and all those modes allow you kind of basically more and more yaw before it, it interrupts. And to your point, it could be hugely useful, but still provide a safety net in case you kind of overdo it. Um, but if you don't have car control basics prior to that, you don't realize, wow, that really saved me versus, oh, that was just a little kind of interruption. So it's sort of understanding what it's uh, preventing and, and and someone new to the sport and, and new to a high horsepower car, for example, um, the, the little things that the car is doing, you may not realize how big of a help that really, truly was. And, you know, if somebody wanted to turn off their traction control in their new fill in the blank car, I'm not going to be in the car when that <laughs> happens. Um, and it really has to do with their uh, risk tolerance and their ability to replace the car or fix it if it goes wrong. And, you know, ultimately that's the best way to do it, but you know, not everybody can take a chance of sailing off the track in a $200,000 car and, you know, sleep well the next night. So it really has to do with, uh, uh pro probably the track, but also the consequences if something went wrong. Actually, that's a good point is, uh, certainly, advice that I've heard and I've shared at times is you should always uh, drive a car that you're willing to drive off a cliff and just push it off and say, I'm done with that one. And if you're not, you're never going to really learn how to drive. And, and, and I guess maybe this comes back to, uh, for me, it's hard to believe, but there are some people that drive on tracks, not to, not for the purpose of learning to be a better driver. They want the thrill Maybe they want to experience what their car is capable of, that kind of thing. To me, driving on a track is all about, well, how can I get better at this? But I also understand that I'm not normal and there are other people who are have different reasons for it. But for somebody that really wants to learn how to be a better driver, uh, you know, that advice of if you're not willing to toss it off a cliff, you, you can't live with that, then that's maybe not the car you should be driving. Thoughts? Oh, that's right. I mean, my... I remember my dad from the time I was a little kid, his, his attitude was you should never get in a car. You're not willing to crash it, which is what you're saying. And it, yeah. it's, tr it's very true. And uh, that's why Miatas are so popular. <laughs> <laughs> that's why the answer to every question is Miata. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. And, and, and actually I, we touched on this before we got started here, but uh, I, I had some friends talking to me about, uh, they've been renting drives, rides in, uh, you know, some teams in various forms of the sort of the low budget endurance racing, which I think is kind of a weird term, low budget in racing. But, um, uh, and, and now they're like, I'm going to start my own team. And, uh, all I know is that I'm going to say, I don't know, at least 80% of the people that I know who said, that's it, I'm going to go start my own team because it's going to save me money and it's going to be better experience, all that stuff. I'm going to say 80% of them regretted it later. And I'm just kind of wondering what, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, especially racers, they, they sort of have this attitude, I can do it better and faster and cheaper. And it's part of the, uh, whatever the, the, the sauce is that makes people attracted to driving fast. You know, I've been exposed to building teams, championship winning teams from the ground up, uh, race winning teams, and um, I've been exposed to sort of the rental side of it and everything in between. 
And, you know, there's no one size fits all for sure. Um, and I would say, you know, do you rent or do you build an, your own team? It really depends on what your objective is. Um, usually, especially, you know, budget endurance racing, there's probably a hybrid approach that's, that's would make the most sense where you find whoever the best in that space is, and it's usually not the cheapest and you do get what you pay for. <laughs> yeah. You find whoever the best is and you kind of sort out where the shortcomings are. Is it strategy? Is it mechanics? Is it uh, pit stops? Is it, uh, you know, what, what are you unhappy about? And, and maybe you help them with that, those particular, particular areas that they're, deficient in. And it could be just ignorance on their part. And it could be, you know, Hey, I just, here's how much money you're paying me. And here's how much it cost me to do this. So if you want more, it's going to cost more. And, um, you know, this sort of, uh, the analogy I think of is, you know, the most expensive car is a cheap, cheap or most, most expensive exotic car is a cheap exotic car. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's sort of a similar thing. And so if you start from scratch, there's so many little things you don't even think about, you know, if the truck breaks down on the way to Thunder Hill in the middle of the night, who's going to get that phone call? Where's, you know, how, how are you going to rent? And all this stuff happens or the, the, the lift gates broken on the truck and who are you going to call? And do you want to deal with that? And, you know, whose tools are you using and what shop and what, how do you deal with insurance? And what happens if you need, you know, spares and and you know who's the contact at the the fuel supplier and who's the contact at the tire place and it's all that stuff you don't even think about when you show up at the track that uh it's it's all solvable and it's all doable but it takes a huge amount of time to build those relationships and make sure you're getting the right price and um it can be done but it's uh it's it's waters i would tread into very uh carefully and, uh, um, but flying lizard, for example, uh, the gentleman who, uh, was the sort of the funding behind that, he had this attitude, you know, you should never, you should rent before you buy and you should always rent if you, if you can get what you want out of the experience, but it became very clear there was nobody in 2003 when we started flying lizard, when Craig and I, and Tommy Sadler and Eric Ingraham and Thomas Blom, who are still there by the way, uh, except for Craig, um, there was just nobody in business at the time that could support the vision that flying lizard later went on to become. No, nobody uh, could dedicate those sorts of resources. And it wasn't so much, of a, of a money thing. It just was a conflict of, of attitudes, uh, of the available teams at the time that could support that kind of ambition. And, uh, you know, money wasn't, we didn't, budget wasn't at the top of the mind, uh, starting flying lizard and, and, uh, we did everything at a very high level and we had the results to, to back it up. Uh, but anything less than that, when you do have a budget, um, y you know, it, it, it's, it's like I'm going through a remodel of my house. It's always more expensive and always costs more and always takes longer and the same, the same for a race team. So I, I would caution people to really think and, uh, ask a lot of questions before jumping into team ownership. I, I don't think anybody has ever said, I'm going to start a team because I, I can do it for less money and then actually had that happen. I think everyone that's ever started a team thinking that they're going to do it for less money ends up spending more money. It's there's just, it, it can't be any other way. Yeah. It, it, and I guarantee to you the, the people that are supporting cars at local club races, they're not getting rich. You know, they're, they're working 10, 12 hours a day. The good guys are working 10, 12 hours a day. And, they're making a living and they're doing it for the, for the joy of it. But you know, it's not, there's nothing easy about it and well, finding good help. It's very tough. Yeah. I mean, ultimately for those people like prep shops and things, it's a, 
fashion business, right? It's it's what they love to do. And, you know, I think some some of them, like myself, would also say, it's the only thing I know. Like I'm unemployable anywhere else, right? So that's right. what I'm going to do. So they find a way to make that work. Um, but yeah, there's very few of them becoming, there are very few Roger Penske's in the world who have made huge amounts of money because of their motorsport involvement. Yeah, and but the case of uh, you know Penske, he he had other businesses to sort of leverage, right? You know, r- racing and his businesses. He did a great job of sort of leveraging <clears throat> them uh, to to help build this big empire. And you know, he's he, that guy's a force of nature. There's no doubt. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's um, something that should be very carefully thought about and and like anything write a business plan and if it and at the end of that business plan do a real business plan at the end of it if it's still exciting well maybe maybe you should try it out but if chances are you'll get a quarter of the way into it and throw up your hands and say all right who should i call to run my car at the next event (laughs) well but so i agree but at the same time i kind of go i can write a business plan that looks great for any business you know, well, you got to be realistic, Ross. <laughs> you got to be realistic. I think that's the key thing because I think that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of business plans are written by people who have a passion for wanting to do whatever this is. So they make the business plan fit their vision. And, and, and actually, I mean, that's a uh, something that I have experienced is people coming into motorsport who have been incredibly successful in other areas, in other businesses and things like that. And they they think that motorsport businesses should run the same way. And, you know, you and I worked on a program, a team a few years ago. And, you know, I think successful business people think that all businesses are going to be successful if you do the exact same thing. And I'm not saying that racing is different, but it's kind of different at, at times. Yeah. No, it's different. I mean, that. that the similarities are you have to have a good team. Yeah. So if you think of, you know, you just got back from Daytona. So, you know, you look at running a car at Daytona and you think of all the various activities that make that possible. Mind boggling. Uh, Yeah. So if you, if you take everybody's responsibility and sort of create a bucket, so you have the driver and the tire changer and the, the fuel person and the strategist and the, uh, the engineer, the team that kind of fills those buckets more than any other team, that's the team that's going to win. And there's luck for sure. There's luck, but the stuff you can control, you have to make sure you are controlling it hundred percent. And the stuff that's out of your control, you know, you get a puncture with, you know, two laps to go and you lose the race. Like, what are you going to do? Okay. Um, and so the, the sort of the, the, the team aspect in terms of building a good team and making sure all the roles that are required, you have the, you know, you have a players and all of them, um, you know, you need to have uh, objectives. You need to uh, hold people accountable when they fall short of those objectives. Um, you need to have a sense of urgency, which seems like, the, the bigger and older businesses get, the less sense of urgency. And I mentioned earlier, I worked for this startup and they raised $2 billion. And the guy that hired me, who was a division president said, you know, you're not going to believe how fast things move around here. And we want you to move fast and make mistakes. And I thought, yeah, we'll see. And it was like watching grass grow compared to racing. I mean, yeah. the time it took to get, and it was considered very fast relative to older businesses, but compared to racing, you know, it was just, it was, again, it's like watching grass grow. So, um, there are definitely a lot of, um, uh, similarities between business and racing, but to your point, it's also, it's, it's, um, it's like a turbocharged version of a very good competitive business. It's just even more. Well, uh, really interesting stuff there. And, in, 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 you know, the, there are so many things, but I, that are the same and, you know, some things that are a little bit different, but uh, the key thing is the people. 
But the, the one thing that I think has been interesting, my observation for a lot of people coming into the sport who want to apply their other world, other experiences is, you know, in their business, they would never make that decision. But in motorsport, all of a sudden they get caught up in the passion, the excitement, the enthusiasm, and they make this, make decisions and go, and, and, and you're looking at going, would you have made that in your own business? And they're like, well, no. Well, why did you make it here? So yeah, I give me an example of that kind of decision. Uh, let me, let me, let me think of, uh, um, you know, where, where maybe somebody has come into the sport and they're thinking, well, we're going to, the, this new team owner is going to buy this new piece of equipment and there's no kind of due diligence done. It's yeah, just, well, let's just buy it. Let's just do that. And I think that, uh, you know, somebody else, if, if that was the same kind of thing in their own company, they probably would have said, you know, okay, we need to, we need, and maybe it's the taking more time, but they would have taken more time to think about it and going, is this truly going to pay off in the long run? And, you know, could be as simple as that. And yet in this case, it's just like, that's a bright, shiny new car. It's fast. Let me buy it. And yeah, without that. doing the, the cost benefit analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I, that's interesting because I, I would, I would say, uh, with two things. One, uh, if you have been a successful professional, in particular in, in business, you have a chance of having a successful team. Yes. If you've been a failure in business, there's no chance. <laughs> there's no chance. Like it's never going to happen. Um, but to your example of not doing the proper cost benefit analysis. I, I've, I've thought about this in a slightly different way. So you take fill in the blank CEO, they've got a killer business. They are the king of the castle. Everyone looks up to them. They step into a new environment and they're still, you know, they're still the big dog, but it's not their area of expertise. And they're afraid of showing their ignorance to kind of all the new uh, bits and pieces that are involved with going racing. And so they sort of mask that by being decisive. If they think they heard, have heard a good idea and oh, this guy must be telling me the right thing. And they just, they, they just pull the trigger because without having the confidence to, to take a step back and ask all the questions because they don't want to reveal uh, a weakness or a self-perceived weakness on their part of not, ha not, this isn't their environment. This isn't their wheelhouse. They don't have the reservoir of knowledge that they have in the business that they've been successful. And so, yes, I, I, I agree with your, your comment. Because some of the worst decisions ever is, uh, are the decisions made at a racetrack in between sessions when it's like, Oh, we get, we need that. Right. <laughs> Yeah, there's no I, doubt. I, I've seen, I've had an experience a bunch of years ago at Daytona with a team where, you know, at some point the team owner should have said, time out, you know, we do have a budget. And the spending kept happening and kept happening and more got spent and more got spent. And I'm pretty sure that some people never got paid that should have got paid um, because things were just being bought that, uh, the, the passion, the enthusiasm, all that stuff got in a way and, you know, kind of taken us back from the professional team level back to a team in a low budget endurance racing or SCCA racing or a team that's going and doing track days. And the team is one person, you know, you talked mm -hmm. about having the right people in the right areas and the buckets and that kind of stuff, but some race teams, it's one person and maybe a spouse and, but I still think that that person needs to think about it as a team. And, you know, there's a great business book, one of my favorite business books, The E-Myth. And it talks about building a business uh, and thinking about your business, no matter how big it is, as you're going to create a franchise, you're going to franchise it. So you basically build it so that it could be 
taken that, handed off to somebody else and all the systems, everything's in place. But in the beginning, you know, you're wearing all the hats, right? You are the head of marketing. You're the CEO or the, the CEO. You're also the accountant. You're the product development person. And, you know, it's no different with the race team. I think if you're a one person team, you got to think about it. You're the engineer, you're the car prep guy, the marketing, whether, whether there is any or not, but you have to think about that because if you don't, you're going to miss something and, and you're the tire guy. Oh, I got to go do my tire guy thing, which is make sure I got air in my tires. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it's easy to, to miss those things if you don't think about it in that, in that way. No doubt. And I, and I think what, what, you know, it, it's, nobody should be surprised that racing takes a lot of money and, and, you know, we've, and a lot of time and a lot of time and, and sort of the areas we've been talking about are sort of at the pointy end of the 40 pointy end of the spectrum. Um, and, uh, I think if there's too much money, the budget's too big, there's not enough, uh, sort of fiscal discipline. Uh, And and I, I think you see this, you can see this in business too. You're, You're not as scrappy and, and it, it leads to less creative solutions to problems as opposed to, Oh, just go over there and buy that new thing. Or in, you know, maybe you could repurpose something you've already had, or maybe you could trade something with another team or borrow an old spare part from a team. You know, there's, there's other ways to go about it. And, um, uh, and I, I think a lot of people get team owners, gentlemen, drivers that are in the sport, they, they, they get surprised by how expensive things are. And they, I can't tell you how many of these guys I've met and they think, well, I've been successful in my business. I'm going to get into racing. I'm going to be successful and I'll figure out how to pay. I'll figure out how to pay for this. How hard can it be? And hmm, a lot of guys have gone out of business or gone to jail because, <laughs> because uh, of that attitude. So it's, yeah. 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 No, that's a, that's a really good point of the, you can actually have too much money. Hard to believe. Yeah. But I think it, it, you, it leads to maybe, I don't know if this, uh, this is probably an unfair term, but lazy decision-making. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's exact, that exact phrase that came into my mind. It's, it's, you, you have no reason to, to be creative when making decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is so interesting. And uh, so if you are thinking about this low budget endurance racing team, think about the things that uh, Johannes and I have just been talking about. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, the, I don't know, they're, I think the joke was, you know, if you're going to do a budget for a race team, you know, go through it, be as diligent as you can with being accurate with the numbers and then at the end of that, just double your budget and add 10 to it. And yeah. <laughs> probably not going to be too too short then. <laughs> probably about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so let's bring it back to, well, actually, let me let me ask Johannes and kind of to start to wrap this thing up is, is what is, you know, what, what is your speed secret for listeners today? What is the one piece of advice that you give listeners today? And typically I aim this to, you know, how, how does a driver listening to this show take something from today and uh, you know, to help them be a better driver? But in this case, it could also be a better team owner. Who knows? Yeah. Well, um, I think my answer to this depends on the challenges that my latest student just had. Ah. Um, so, so two two things. One in terms of uh, kind of just closing the loop on the rent or own uh, yeah. endurance racing. Um, you know, one thing you got to make sure that the uh, equipment is as good as it possibly can be for, you know, fits within the rules and is sort of the best example possible. Um you know, you want to, racing is fun and you want to have a car that is fun to drive. So you need to make sure you have someone on the team that can make it 
safe, reliable, and fun to drive. Those mm -hmm. are sort of three. Th those are kind of three absolutely have to haves before you consider doing something like that. And I, I'm sure you could share plenty of stories too. I can't tell you how many cars I've driven. And I have the benefit of driving thousands of different cars and you can tell in the first corner if the car is any good or not, usually. And, and these people, and, and these some people, of, some of them are, are you, you get to the first corner and you go, this car is actually not going to be that much fun. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I, I've had a few situations. I haven't even finished a lap. I'd come right in and say, I, you're a hero. I don't know how you've done this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and then a uh, speed secret. So, so, uh, the one I give to my kids riding their bikes to new drivers, friends of ours, that kids are starting to drive and people driving on the track is look ahead. That's the first one. It's, it's, you buy yourself time by looking far down the road. Um, and then the second one that seems to be the separator between the good and great drivers is knowing, you know, starting with how you apply the brakes and knowing when to release the brake to preserve the momentum down to the apex. And that, uh, that part of driving is probably the hardest to learn and getting back to our earlier conversation, that's one you really have to good, have to have a good feel for. Um, mm. And, you know, traction control doesn't help you going down to the apex. Um, stability control would if you really overshot it, but, but it's knowing when to come off the brake and preserve that momentum down to the apex. Well, that uh, reminds me of one of my favorite quote. So it was from Mark Donahue and I've shared it on this show many times before, but I'll say it again is he said that driving a car at the limit, exiting the corner. So getting on the power, getting the car down and driving the car at the limit is like tightrope walking, but entering a corner on the limit is like jumping onto a tightrope blindfolded. Yeah. And it's like, that is like so perfect because you don't really know what you've got until you're there. Yeah. And, and, and it is all about how you release the brake pedal. Um, that's so, so interesting. And when you said, look ahead, you know what I thought of, you know, obviously it applies to driving and everything, but I thought about what we're talking about in terms of the team and the decisions and the lazy decisions or the decisions driven strictly by passion. Sometimes, you know, I've seen drivers get out of a car and make a decision that is maybe good for the next session but it's not good for the rest of the year. So it's the same kind of thing there as well. It's kind of look ahead with those decisions as well and go, is this the best decision for the long term? Yeah, that's right. You have to have, um, you know, it's always good to have the big picture in mind making any decision. And, you know, sometimes a, a result short term will greatly <laughs> affect your or lack yeah. of result will greatly affect your long-term uh, decision-making as well. But um, uh, yeah, trusting a car, it, as we've talked before, you know, off, offline, as, as fast as a car can go around a racetrack is all based on the amount of available grip in the tire. So if every time you're asking something, going down the straightaway, anybody can hold their foot to the floor and anybody can do that. But Unless you're driving you... a Tesla going up over the rise at turn one at Laguna gets a little interesting. Okay. Sorry. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Uh, but you know, every time you ask something of the tire, so you're braking, you're turning, you're exiting the corner. If that tire is on the absolute edge of adhesion, that's as fast as you can go. And I don't think, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, all the, the shocks and the wings and the springs and the sway bars or, you know, semi-active dampers, which makes life a lot more interesting. That is all about making the tire work harder. And the pe people that do it right 
you know, the engineers or the driver engineer types that really understand how to get the most out of the tire are the ones that will beat you every time, even if they're not as good of a driver. Yeah. And it's, and, um, uh, but yeah, for those of you listening, really focus on, on carrying speed down to the apex. Yeah. It's funny. Cause the, the, the first piece of advice that most drivers are given is in slow out fast. And I think that's, it's good advice at a certain point, but there's a point where it's way, way, way overdone. And that's what you're talking about here. So, um. yeah, the, the in slow out fast, I don't know who came up with that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> how about in fast out fast? Like that? well, That's what I've always said, you know, in fast out faster. I mean, that's a pretty good thing to do. So yeah. 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 yeah about the only time is, you know, if it's a really tight corner and you know, you, you get off the brake too early and you understeer, then yeah, you need to back it off to get the car turned so you can get on the power, but, but maybe uh, it was because of the way you came off the brake pedal to begin with. And maybe you could have carried that much speed if you'd come off the brake pedal more appropriately. True. So true. Well, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Next time we talk, we're going to just talk. All we're going to do is do a show completely on releasing the brake pedal. How's that? We can do it. I got a lot to say about it. <laughs> okay. And when, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stay tuned, everybody. Um, hey, uh, uh, you've been way, way, way more active on social media with uh, your Instagram account and showing some really cool photos of different things that you're doing, especially some of the fun cars you've been driving recently. Uh, what's your Instagram um, account or name? Um, or? It's just my name, Johannes Van Overbeck. Okay. And you can you can find it. I actually don't know exactly what it is, but <laughs> it, I don't have any clever... Uh, alias good well guess what i'm mine's the same way it's just my name <laughs> yeah i've got nothing to hide <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. i had uh something the other day where somebody sent me one and they were like their instagram name is actually a person's name but it's not their their name i'm like well, how does this work or what is it? so anyways it's yeah that sounds confusing yeah yeah <laughs> Well, hey, Johannes, thanks for uh, being on the show. And I know we're going to be doing some, uh, we're, we're going to be at a track soon, uh, getting to play with the uh, Garmin Catalyst again pretty soon. So um, it's such a fun, fun thing to play with and uh, show people because it's so cool. It's very cool. And uh, yeah, I encourage anybody who hasn't uh, heard about it to, to Google Garmin Catalyst, check it out. There's some videos out and uh try to demo one because it's, it's a very powerful training tool. I actually, uh, when I went back to, to, to Kansas and did some, some work, I was, it was teaching me some things to, to try differently. And, and it, it was just, I couldn't believe how cool it was. Yeah. I've shared that story of how it, you know, I've done some, a bunch of development thing. And then, then I just said, you know what, okay, I'm going to just listen to it and t let it tell me what to do. And I knocked nine tenths of a second off of my best lap time, just doing what it told me to do. And I'd been driving on this track for a while and I've driven a few cars on different tracks through the years. So it uh, opened my eyes. Yeah. It's again, very powerful tool and, and uh, definitely cutting edge of technology in terms of what's uh, what's available to help you get faster as a driver yeah. more safely. Yeah. Well, a, uh, we'll, we will see you at a track uh, pretty soon. We just got to work on our schedules to make that happen. And, uh, you know, usual, keep having fun out there. Likewise, Ross. Yeah, thanks. Look forward to it. If you are listening to Ross, reading one of his books, or watching a webinar, chances are you're a pretty fast driver, or even really fast. But you probably want more. You want to lower your lap times or maybe even a little bit faster. But how? Ross's Drive Faster webinar has some answers. It will help you understand what to do, then give you a plan for doing it. Ross shares many of his proven strategies for making you a faster driver. This is an information-packed webinar that you can view, review, and rewind anytime, again and again. When a driver thinks he or she has set a personal best lap time, Ross usually says, remember, there's always more. Well, that's true with this three-hour webinar that was recorded over two sessions. There's no better time than right now to learn skills and concepts and put together your plan for taking your driving to the next level. 
Go to speedsecrets.com backslash webinars to download the Drive Faster session and keep learning.